Would you pray with me? Lord, we come this morning just thankful that we can be here. Thankful that we can um, join together with our, our family and friends to just worship you and to learn how to be in relationship with you better. We thank you for this morning and for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with, uh, the little bit cooler temperatures. And Lord, we, we just ask for those of our group that are not here that you would um, touch them, let them uh, know and feel our, our love for them as we worship you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand and let's join together in reading the Apostles' Creed. It'll either be on the screen or in your hymnal on page 881, if you would rather. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's join our voices in singing number 400 in your hymnal or on the screen. Come thou font of every blessing. to come at this time and we'll gather our morning offering.
we ask that you would receive these gifts and offerings um, that are coming from our hearts, from hearts that are filled with praise and love for you. We pray that these gifts might be multiplied and used, Lord, to further your kingdom here in, in the place where we live. We thank you and we love you more than we can ever say by our giving. But because of our hearts, Lord, we offer up our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So this has been a, a busy week, um, but did you meet God anywhere during your week? Did you run into him? Did you find him um, helping in your life in any particular way this week? Yes? When I get to St. Matthew, they're, they're always ready now to help me unload, and they do most of it. Bless their hearts, good. With how many pounds? 326 pounds? I'm glad somebody helps you unload. That's amazing. Good. That's good. Anybody else? Where have you seen Jesus at work in your life? Who is it? Good. Friends are a real gift, aren't they? We start very at blessed. the beginning and we go one thing, one thing to another. Good. Yeah. Well, I am, I just, I have, I'm, I don't like to call attention to anyone in particular, but I just have to thank our friend Nick back there for uh, bringing Don this morning, for picking him up and giving him away to church. So thank you, Nick and Don. We are so happy to see you. That's great. Been a while, haven't it? Yep. Yeah. So we're glad you're here today. Yeah. Yeah. He was very excited to be able to come. I was excited when I heard you were bringing him. That's that's great. What a friend. But Monty. Uh, I attended my uh, uncle's funeral on Friday, and uh, we're not the funeral of my uh, He would have been a hundred. September the 4th, wow. and his wife Judy, which is my dad's sister, is the last living of uh, my children. Mm. So therefore, in 18, it was his uncle's name. Yeah. And it was it's a good service. Good, good. It's always hard to say goodbye to the uh, to the generation. You know, that's, that's all. Yeah, that's a hard thing. Jody, Jody turned uh, uh, 97 on uh, Thursday. Yeah, I think that's amazing that they both have had that long. They took good care of each other, didn't they? They're your children. That's a hard thing, yeah. Okay. Are there other prayer needs? Are there things, others? Yes. Um, I'd like prayers for Jennifer's mother-in-law, who will be harboring. She lost her sister and sister-in-law the same week, two weeks ago. Um, so prayers for her and that family. And um, <laughs> we said 
said, where does God need you? It was not the greatest week that I got served with the first week of school. So I guess I need to thank you for that. And also, continue prayers for Hank. He's down to one hydrocortisone pill now for three more weeks. And he's back in school, so that's a little bit of a concern. But he had three days this past week in, in cancer, so he did well. Good. So okay. just, just that he gets safe from all the germs and stuff out there. Right. Because if that if he gets sick, he may have to start over before they can, you know, find out whether he's producing that yeah, on his own. Not a real good test if he gets sick. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think we need to keep all of the teachers and students in our prayers yet, but it takes a while to, for the newness to wear off and everybody to get in the groove, so uh, we just keep them all lifted up. Are there any others? Okay. Yes, Anita. Can you pray for Mom? Yep. Yep. <coughs> okay. Then let's take some time and we'll just uh, go before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come um, and we bow before you because we know that uh, this time that we take, whether it's here at church or at home, to just communicate with you, to uh, to share the, the joys of our hearts and those concerns that are heavier than we can carry by ourselves. It is so important uh, to our well-being that we take this time. And so we, we meet you at our, our prayer rail this morning, Lord. Just so thankful for all the joys that uh, we've each experienced during this week. There are uh, so many ways that you make yourself known to us, and many times we're, um, we're too busy to, to just notice uh, how things come about and to give you the praise and glory for making them come about. Uh, it, it's a... a, a such a satisfying feeling to be able to kneel before you and lift up the needs of others because we know that you hear our prayers and we know that when we name those that are uh, in need of prayer that uh, it, it moves them right before your throne and, and that you know so well exactly what each person's concern is and what their need is. And only you can uh, meet those needs in a way that is right and best for them. So this morning, Lord, we lift these up to you, uh, these that we've named. Hank, as he continues to uh, find a way to be off the steroids so that uh, he will begin to grow and and experience life as, as you created him to. We lift up Jane uh, at the loss of her children. Um, it, it is so hard for a parent to, um, to let go of children, even though they be adults, even though they could be aged adults. They still are your kids, and it is just... Um, hard time to turn them back over to you, Lord. We want to lift up Lois, um, our, the loss of her sister and sister-in-law so close together. We lift up Jerry to you. Uh, we just ask that you will continue to uh, work in her life and, and to help her health uh, perhaps gain a little bit of um, strength so that she might be able to get out and be around a little more often. And Lord, um, every one of us here have 
uh, issues that we lift before you that we don't want to name out loud. We don't need to name them out loud. That's why prayer is such a beautiful gift, is because you know what it is that, uh, that breaks our hearts. It's troubling us. And for that, we are so thankful. Lord, I, I want to lift up our United Methodist denomination and every United Methodist church in the world, Lord, as we um, contemplate the issues that are before us and how we can go about being the best witness for you in the world that we live in. So, Lord, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your strength. We ask that you bring um, all of the insight that we need to us so that we know exactly what it is that you want us to do and will not feel like we're betraying you or perhaps friends that will do the right thing. And Lord, we ask that you hear us as your family, your children, and we'll pray together today as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would like to now, uh, let's join together in singing, I Surrender All. It'll be on the screen, or it's in number 354 in your hymnal.
that song, but um, if you really look at the words, um, it may be kind of difficult to do what we say we're doing uh, when we sing that song. You know? Surrendering our will is um, that's probably one of the hardest things, at least for me. I don't know about you guys, and I'm glad Terry's not here today to say amen to that, but I'm sure he would. Um, it's surrendering our will is a very difficult thing. Um, our, our lesson this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're looking at chapter 3 this week. We're taking one chapter each week as we go. So let me read to you what the writer of Hebrews has to, uh, for us to look at today. It says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we, who we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of, of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did, that is why I was angry with, what, with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, and as, as and has just been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So we are in uh, the third week of our series. This is the third chapter. Um, I'm calling it How to Hold Fast. Uh, and I titled it that because I feel like right now um, there are many of us that kind of feel like we're... Um, uh, falling apart or flying apart maybe is a better word for it. Um, there's just so much going on with the United Methodist nomination right now. And um, I think it's really important that we hold on tight to what we know and what we believe right now. Um, so let's, let's go back and kind of catch us up a little bit. Um, Chapter 1, uh, in that chapter we saw that Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of God. He is God in the flesh. We learned that he provided purification for the sins of the whole world. And afterwards, after he had completed that, he sat down at the right hand of, what did our, our pledge, our creed say this morning? At the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We learn that Jesus is all we will ever need because he's done all that can possibly be done for our salvation. That's what we learned in week one. 
Last week, Terry talked to you about um, how God created mankind to be in dominion over the entire world. We are to have authority over everything. But I think we found out the truth is we don't have authority over everything because we don't even have authority over ourselves. That's why Jesus came into the world. He became one of us so that by his death, we don't have to taste death. He did it for everyone. His death eliminates our need for fear. His death eliminates any guilt that we might feel. And his death um, should overpower that tendency we have toward weakness because it's in him that we have power. In him, we can become what God has made us or created us to be. So now let's look at chapter 3, and, and let's see what, um, what the writer of Hebrews has in store for us here. The writer has been kind of using a, a greater than, a greater than motif. In chapter 1, if you'll remember, he said that Jesus was greater than the prophets, he was greater than the angels, he was greater than all creation. Last week, he went back to even uh, reiterate that a little more. He said, Jesus is greater than any angel, even the archangels. Now in chapter 3, he continues this idea by saying that Jesus is greater than Moses. You see, there is a progression in his thinking. First century Jewish people had a really great respect for the prophets. And they had a real reverence for uh, the angels. But I'll, let me tell you, they thought Moses was the greatest man that had ever walked the face of the earth. I mean, after all, he had spoken to God face to face, just like an ordinary man talks to his best friend. So in their eyes, <clears throat> that made Moses even greater than the angels. But then he says, after naming all of those, the prophets, the angels, the archangels, Moses, he says, Jesus, though, is greater than them all. He goes on to try to explain it. He said, uh, Moses served faithfully in the house of God, but it's Jesus for whom the house was built. Moses was a servant in the house. Jesus, as the Son of God, is in charge of the house. And so um, I have to ask, what is this house he's talking about? Anybody have an idea? Oh, come on. The house is you and me, you and I, the people of God, the church. Jesus is the head of the church. All the others before, in other words, the prophets, the servants, uh, or the... Um, prophets and the angels, they were all servants for the people of God. But Jesus is the head of that household. The rest of our chapter tells us uh, how important it is to stay in the house. Now, you know, that's, that's kind of mild uh, wording. I think it's really important for us to stay in Jesus because I think that's the only place, the only way that we can hold on to our faith. Otherwise, we're going to just splinter off little pieces of our faith till there's nothing left to hold us close to Jesus. So we're going to talk about how to hold fast how to stay true, how to, to uh, be in this house in a way that we don't have to worry about flying apart or flying away from it. We, uh, <clears throat> we have to uh, realize that we can't waffle between following the world's ways and following God's ways. We have to decide who we are and whose we are. 
And so that's what we're going to really tackle this morning, how to hold fast to our identity as Christians. The writer of Hebrews is um, kind of leading up to the idea that we can enter into a place of rest in the presence of God. Now, I know it doesn't feel like we're resting very often, does it? But this, this family of God, this house of God, is designed to be a place of security, a place of, of freedom, a place of abundance, a place where we can escape the struggle of trying to be something we're not. And instead, we receive the power to become more than we ever imagined we could ever be. Being in the family of God is, is being in a place of victory over sin, a place of righteousness, a place of peace, a place of joy in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this is the direction that God wants to take us. This is what he wants for each one of us. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't miss it. Don't disqualify yourself from the life of abundance that Jesus has in store for you. Here in, in Hebrews in chapter 3, I think we can, we can find three things that we can do every day to help us hold fast, to help us stay faithful to Christ. And the very first thing we have to do is set our mind on Jesus. Verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Fix your thoughts on Jesus. I'm going to ask you a really pointed question. You don't have to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it in your heart. How many of you, every day, spend time in his word? How many of you, every day, take time to pray? How many of you, every day, think about Jesus? Even think about him sometime during the day. Let me tell you something. The more you think about him, the more you will love him. The more you think about him, the better you will know him. The more you think about him, the more you will sense his presence in your life. So I'm telling you, in the morning, first thing, take time. Take time to read, even if it's just a verse or two of Scripture. <coughs> it, could be, it could be from anywhere. It could be from the Gospels. It could be from one of Jesus' sermons, one of his parables. It doesn't matter where or what, but read something that connects you to Jesus. And then all day long, take little moments to just uh, think about what you read, to remember and to try to figure out how that reading, what you read, affects you or talks to you, speaks to you. You become... Uh, mentally connected to him when you do that. Um, it, it becomes um, a, 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 a lifeline that connects you to Jesus. And the more you fix your thoughts on him, the more you will love him, the more you will know him, the more you will sense his presence in your life. Um, don't forget he, his, um, his cell phone is connected to you all the time. He never puts it on hold or, or he never sends you to voicemail. He is there to hear you if you need to pray to him, if you need to just talk and, and converse with him. Um, prayer is not always about your needs or someone else's needs. You know, prayer can be a, a very simple Thank you, Lord, for this cooler weather today. You know, I'm really loving this, and this will give me more energy. 
to do the things that I want to do for you, Lord. So prayer is, is just conversing with God. It isn't about our needs necessarily. So take time to think about it. Take time to pray every day, even just little snippets. Um, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is our apostle. Uh, all the other New Testament writers use the word apostle to define an, an office or a, a job, if you have it, in the church. But the writer of Hebrews uses the word only in reference to Jesus. And I think that's because the Greek word for um, apostle means one who has been sent. It could also be translated ambassador. So he's saying, in other words, that Jesus came to us on God's behalf. He also said that Jesus is our high priest. William Barclay, who's one of my favorite theologians of the, the last century anyhow, points out that the Latin word for priest means literally bridge builder. Um, and you stop and think about it. That's what Jesus did. He was sent from God to, to build a bridge between us and God, between human beings and God. As a high priest, he speaks to us on God's behalf, and he speaks to God on our behalf. Jesus stands between you and God. It, it's kind of a bit of a stretch to think that there might be any negotiating going on, on our, for our benefit, but the Bible does say that he he intercedes for us. That's why John wrote these words. If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So Jesus came to represent God to us. Today he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he represents us to God. That's what he does. That's who he is. So fix your thoughts on him. Train yourself to think about him at different times throughout the day. Because the more you think about Jesus, the stronger you'll be in your daily walk. The second thing we need to do in order to hold fast is to hang on to our hearts. I mentioned a little earlier that there was an entire generation of Israelites that were not permitted to enter the promised land uh, because they'd rebelled against God over and over and over until he finally said, that's it. You're not ready for life in the promised land. You refuse to even get ready, so I can't let you enter. Now, the promised land really wouldn't have been the promised land very long if it became inhabited by people that were prone to griping and complaining and whining and bickering. These habits don't make for good society. And if you don't believe that, just look at our world today. Look how society is so negative. It's complaining about everything. It's divisive. There's, somebody's always finding someone to blame about something. Or they're picking on someone. Bullying wasn't even a word when I was a kid. You know, while the people of Israel were making their journey through the desert, God was, he was doing more in their life than just leading them across the desert. He was trying to help them learn how to become holy people. But they refused. They refused to even take that part of the lesson to heart. He was trying to teach them how to trust his goodness. But they refused to put their trust in him. He was trying to teach them to be faithful to his word. And again, they refused to obey. So he could not let them enter Canaan as they were. They would have just made a mess of it. So he kept that generation out in the desert until they all died. This is, uh, this is an unfortunate decision that he had to make. He can't lead any of us into his place of rest if we're not ready to rest. 
We can't enter the promised land if we're still embracing the desert la lifestyle. So what was the sin that these people of Israel committed? In this chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3 of Hebrews, and in the next, we're going, to, we're going to talk about it a lot because the Hebrew writer quotes Psalm 95 three times. So I think that means in the uh, Hebrew way of doing things, this is a super important concept. Anything that was repeated three times back then was deemed to be a really important idea. The verse says, If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. The Israelites missed out on the promised land because their hearts were hard. In other words, their hearts were far away from God. The writer says in verse 12, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That same message or verse in the message says, Watch your step, friends. Make sure there's no evil unbelief lying around that will trip you up and throw you off course, diverting you from the living God. Unbelief lies at the root of our bad behavior. The scriptures that you see up on the screen today are references about unbelief and false belief. I spent a whole morning last week looking up uh, verses that in just the New Testament that dealt with unbelief or um, false belief, and I came up with a whole huge big sheet of them. There's just I don't know what I wound up putting up seven or eight of them up there for you. I think the UM Church today is in the midst of sorting out our unbelief. And uh, there are those that are, are trying to, I don't know, lead us into confusion or lead us off the beaten path so that there can be an agenda pushed that may not be Christian. When we don't believe God will provide, uh, we don't bother to pray. We just start worrying. When we don't believe God will be faithful in a difficult situation, we tend to take matters into our own hands and start doing things our way, whether they're right or wrong. When we don't believe God is watching out for our best interests, we gripe and complain and whine and bellyache. All of these things get us off course. Do you know what did the Israelites in? It wasn't their lying or cheating or stealing. It was a lack of belief in the goodness of God that caused them to turn their hearts away from him. And once they turned their hearts away, their actions followed. The writer of Hebrews quotes what God had spoken in the Psalms. It says, This is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, They shall never enter my rest. Do you see the connection here? Their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. Just as thinking about Jesus helps us walk more closely with Jesus, keeping our hearts close to God helps us know him better. So how do we do that? How do we keep our heart close to God? How do we prevent our hearts from becoming hardened? I think there's three key words. Surrender, believe, obey. Surrender. Every day of your life, every day of your life, countless times throughout the day, you need to intentionally surrender your heart to God. It's not hard. You simply say, God, 
here's my heart, it's yours. May be a little cold right now, may not be as tender as it could be or should be, but I'm giving it to you. That simple. Intentional. The second, believe. Every day of your life, you choose to believe the promises of God. You choose to believe that God is working all things together for good for you. That he's guiding your steps, that he will provide what you need when you need it. I'm not saying you choose to feel a certain way. I'm saying you choose to believe. And then obey. Every day, every day of your life, you make a sacrifice of obedience to God. Every day, you'll definitely have a chance to do at least one thing, one thing that you don't necessarily want to do, that he's asking you to do, or you'll have the chance to not do one thing that you really maybe want to do that you shouldn't. But it will happen every day. And when the opportunity presents itself, choose to obey God. Even if it's not easy, even if you don't feel like it, choose to obey. Every time you make this sacrifice of obedience, you're softening your heart. The people I know that have been successfully married for lots and lots of years are the ones that, that still actively love one another. They still actively uh, work at nurturing their relationships. They made a covenant in their vows that said something about guarding our hearts together. They say things like, we won't let anyone or anything come between us. And you know what? The, the most well-adjusted Christians I know have the same kind of attitude. They understand that our relationship with God must be nurtured. We must look after it every day. It can't be just something that you do on Sundays. It's kind of like tending a garden. If you, if you want to enter into all that God has planned for you, then guard your heart. Solomon said, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And here's the third thing we have to do. We have to take care of those around us. Verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Do you know what I've noticed? I've noticed when I'm around certain people, I don't sin as much. When I'm around them, I'm much less prone to complain or or gossip, or even give up hope. On the other hand, there are some people who only have to walk into the room, and, and uh, I start just kind of spiraling down. But back to that first group of people. They understand what the writer of Hebrews is saying. They understand that he tells us that if we will offer encouragement to one another, we can help each other avoid the pitfalls of sin. Encourage one another daily. Two key words in that phrase. The first one is encourage. Not nag, not belittle, not criticize, not any of those, but strictly encourage. Years ago, I, I went to work for the State Board of Health as a meat inspector, and my supervisor was... Um, a very uh, negative kind of guy. And uh, he would just get on us inspectors terribly hard. And one day I said to him, hey, hey, Doc, I really could use a little bit of encouragement. And he fired back, I am being encouraging. I'm encouraging you not to be so dumb about this. I didn't feel very encouraged, let me tell you. Here's an easy way to identify encouragement. It feels good to hear it. It builds you up. It strengthens you. That's real encouragement. 
That second word, daily, that's like seven days in a week, you know, one every day kind of thing. I'm kind of a literalist. Um, I take that to mean that within a 24-hour period, I am supposed to find somebody that I can encourage. You know the Bible never says rebuke one another daily or call out one another daily or scold one another daily. It does say, what? Encourage one another daily. And that's because when you offer people encouragement, you help them become more holy. You help them maintain their tender heart. You help them keep their thoughts directed toward Jesus. And do you know what else? You help yourself. Solomon says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So when you're passing out encouragement, some of it comes back your own way. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? He's saying here that these people are the same people who witnessed tremendous miracles by the hand of God. You remember the plagues of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the manna in the desert, the water gushing out of the rock, the cloud by day and the fire by night, and yet that wasn't enough for them. Even after all they saw and experienced, their hearts turned cold and they became like stone. Verse 19 says, so we see that they were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Scary, isn't it? If they can be disqualified from entering into God's fullness, that means any of us can be at risk too. We can't live our life on the strength of a, a spiritual experience we had back in high school when we went to summer camp. We can't base our faith on uh, an experience we had back in the 90s at Emmaus or some other group. We, um, we can't even fall back on when we first started coming to church. That's not enough. God wants us to be involved, engaged, connected to him in the present, in, the, in this moment today. He wants his people to enter into his rest, that place of special blessing found in his presence. He's not trying to exclude anyone. He's trying to prepare everyone. He wants everyone to be ready for life in the promised land. We don't want to miss it. So first of all, keep your mind on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on him. The more you think of him, the more closely you'll walk with him. Number two, hang on to your heart. Nurture your relationship with God. Keep your heart where it should be through surrender, belief, and sacrificial obedience. And thirdly, look around you. The people you see all around you need your encouragement every day. And you need to give it. Don't let a day go by without building up a brother or sister. These are things that prevent us from falling away, falling by the wayside. These are things that will help us hold fast. They'll keep our heart in the right place. Amen. Let's stand and we'll join together in our closing hymn this morning. Trust and Obey.